Hello, everybody. The first case related to COVID-19 pandemic was confirmed in New York City in March 2020 in a woman who had recently traveled to New York City from Iran. Nearly a month later, the metropolitan area was the worst affected area in the country with its medical infrastructure functioning beyond the capacity. By April, the city had more confirmed coronavirus cases than China, the UK, or Iran, and by May had more cases than any country other than the United States. In addition, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers were out of work. Since IVF treatment was directly affected by the spread of the virus, the lockdown imposed on people and the economic crisis that the pandemic caused, we thought that it would be very interesting to invite Dr. Norbert Gleicher to discuss the topic, a fertility center in New York City going through COVID-19, economic depression and riots. Dr. Gleicher is the president, medical director and chief scientist of the Center of Human Reproduction in New York and the president of the non-for-profit foundation for reproductive medicine. He has published hundreds of peer-reviewed scientific papers, abstracts, and book chapters in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. And he kindly agreed to discuss the situation in New York. So Norbert, please. Uh, thank you very much, Zev. Uh, and also a big uh, thank you to Milton uh, for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, since I must say, um, having been around in the IVF field for a very long time, uh, to be more specific, since 1981 when we opened our first IVF center in those days in Chicago, uh, the last three months have probably been the most challenging uh, period uh, of my IVF-related uh, career. Uh, and after almost 40 years, I think that is a lot uh, to say. Uh, and as I hope I will be able to transmit over the next uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, the city, and therefore we uh, at our center have gone through some quite unique, remarkable, and at times uh, difficult circumstances. So again, thanks for giving me this opportunity and um, I'm happy uh, to tell this story. Um, so uh, in the US, we, before every talk, have to make a conflict statement um, I don't think that there are any specific co uh, conflicts uh, relating to today's uh, subject, um, but uh, everybody who is listening to this should nevertheless know that uh, I do have certain uh, commercial interests, um, hold m uh, quite a number of patents, receive royalties, etc. This is our center. Uh, this is the entrance into our center. And for those of you who know uh, New York City and especially Manhattan, uh, we are really in the center of Manhattan. Um, we are on the corner of Madison Avenue and 69th Street, a very prosperous area uh, in Midtown on the border to Uptown in Manhattan, just one block away. Uh, from Central Park. Uh, I will come back to this location because uh, once we will be talking about some of the unrest that we have witnessing over the last uh, 10 to, to 11 days, um, uh, you will understand the importance of this location. Uh, and I will address three separate experiences, if we can call it that, uh, 
obviously the leading one is the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, unprecedented, not only in my IVF career, but really unprecedented in my, in, in, in my life. Uh, never thought that I would experience uh, something like uh, this. And obviously the impact on the IVF community uh, in the US and in New York City has been dramatic. Uh, the second issue uh, is the economy. Obviously the US uh, shut down like many countries did. Uh, I will a little bit comment on this later on. Um, but New York City is still shut down. We are still in only what is called phase one of reopening, uh, which means that we still do not have uh, open restaurants. Uh, we have only delivery and pickup, uh, curb pickup. Uh, we still cannot go uh, to get a haircut. I haven't had a haircut in uh, over three months and uh, soon we'll have to wear a ponytail. Uh, so uh, the city is still largely closed down. Uh, supposedly we will enter phase two uh, next week, uh, which will mean that uh, some of these businesses will open up. Uh, but you would still not recognize, after all of these weeks and months, you still would not recognize New York, which was always bustling, which was always loud, which always had traffic jams. None of that exists uh, anymore. Uh, I'm always jokingly telling uh, my friends that I was never able to find a parking uh, spot uh, close to our office on our street uh, during uh, regular hours. Uh, if I uh, take my car uh, for a little ride, uh, usually short rides because there's nowhere to go, uh, and I return an hour later, now the same spot is usually still open. Unheard of in New York, but now, uh, as I said, a routine. A lot of New Yorkers left New York. Uh, it therefore, uh, particularly in economically uh, better off areas, uh, buildings are empty. Uh, people went uh, to the country homes uh, where they felt safer. At the same time, uh, while having been on the, at the very top of cases, as I will. Uh, shortly demonstrate, uh, we uh, are now very rapidly uh, declining uh, in both case numbers and more importantly hospitalizations and mortality. So the worst seems to be over and we are starting to be cautiously uh, optimistic, um, but you can still very clearly feel the uniqueness of what we have been experiencing in conjunction with COVID-19 and uh, with the consequences, with the economic consequences uh, of uh, the shutdown of practically uh, almost all businesses. And then um, at the end of last month and the beginning of June, uh, a third unique event happened uh, with, uh, with the horrible murder uh, of a black man in Minneapolis uh, by an out of control uh, police officer uh, that resulted in a political response which again in many ways uh, not only was unexpected um, but uh, was also beyond anything um, that we have seen in a very long time, I would say at least since the 1960 riots and maybe some of the race riots in Los Angeles uh, after another police assault on a black man uh, in, in, in those days. We saw uh, many peaceful demonstrations 
but particularly around uh, June 1, June 2, as I will show you a little later, we also saw horrible rioting. Uh, we saw looting uh, in areas that have never seen that before, and whole areas like Soho, like Madison Avenue, as I said, uh, that is the avenue where our center is just off Madison Avenue and 69th Street. Uh, Fifth Avenue, uh, all areas uh, that have never seen any any rioting and any looting uh, of uh, this extent exploded. Uh, and I will come back to that. So these are the three topics I want to address. And uh, we are going to start obviously with the pandemic uh, and even though Zev already gave you a historical introduction I want to go a little bit more into detail to demonstrate to you how um, unprepared uh, we were caught by this uh, pandemic uh, here in the US and particularly in New York State and New York City. So officially, the, the virus was first uh, reported, detected, whatever you want to call it, in Wuhan province in China in December of last year. Uh, there are now data, particularly a study from out of Harvard, uh, which was based on aerial observations of traffic, uh, uh, car traffic around hospitals, recently suggests that uh, or recently supports prior reports that actually this this virus was probably circulating in Wuhan already two to three months earlier than December. Uh, a first case in the U.S. Uh, was reported in mid-January and it was reported on the West Coast. The first case in New York, as Zev mentioned it, uh, uh, this was uh, a traveler from Iran, was reported on March 1. Um, already by March 7, uh, when there were only 76 cases, the governor of New York already declared a state of emergency. Uh, and this was largely based on uh, a first outbreak in the suburb of New York, where an attorney uh, who, who was a member of a very close-knit Jewish community uh, was uh, infected and very quickly uh, infected many other people. And uh, New Rochelle, which is the suburb, uh, was within days the first quarantine zone uh, in the U.S. Now, when this happened, I have to acknowledge that I thought it was exaggerated. And I thought it was exaggerated because when we first heard about this virus in China, we were reassured by our most prominent uh, public health and virology experts that there was nothing to worry about. Uh, that this was a virus uh, that uh, really did not represent any danger to the United States. Uh, those are those experts who later on very quickly obviously changed their minds uh, and very quickly became amongst the strongest proponents going to the other extreme and uh, arguing for a complete shutdown of, of the U.S. Uh, economy. Uh, so we were ignorant and we were also unprepared. And when I'm saying we, uh, I'm grateful for not having had all of these responsibilities. But we applies to almost everybody. It applies to the federal government that was unprepared. It applies to New York State and many other states that were unprepared, that didn't have even minimal supplies ready. And I'm sure that this will become subject of future investigations, why and how that could have happened. 
because it was really pathetic. Once the epidemic was here and once uh, the, the load of patients in hospitals very quickly increased, uh, it was, it is unbelievable to imagine the scenes uh, that we witnessed in America. Uh, and uh, in retrospect, uh, it, it, is, it is really hard to understand uh, that responsible parties, whether this is at the federal, the local government, but even at major hospitals, that hospitals didn't have policies and supply reserves in place that were ready for this onslaught. And this is what I want to show you here because uh, there was time. Look, the first case, as I, as I showed you before, was in the mid of January on the West Coast. By two months later, Mar middle of March, uh, there were already 325 cases and Broadway was closed. But this was still a highly manageable situation. Yet, when things got worse, and they obviously very quickly did get worse uh, after the middle of March. And you can see here uh, on, the, on the right always the number of cases and the number of deaths as of those days. And you, say, you can see that starting in, in the middle of March, suddenly both of these numbers, hospital admissions and number of deaths, uh, started rising in a log at a logarithmic scale. And what this in practical terms means that there were two months to prepare. But apparently there was not much preparation because uh, when this onslaught finally happened, hospitals were overwhelmed. And uh, if you witnessed some of the scenes and if you spoke to some of the, the first line providers, whether nurses or doctors, uh, the stories you heard were simply unbelievable and, and might not have been surprising in a third world country without the appropriate healthcare infrastructure, but nobody nobody could have expected this kind uh, of, of, of situation in a place like New York City. It was at this time that ASRM for the first time, for the, for the first time published a guidance uh, and uh, this document uh, ended up uh, being highly, highly controversial because it was understood by most colleagues as a recommendation to close down all IVF activities. Uh, as I will come back to a little later, this was not our interpretation of the SRM guidance and therefore our center never closed. But this was clearly uh, the interpretation of most people, whether it was the intent of the SRM uh, to have everybody closed down or not, I cannot comment on. Uh, but uh, the consequence was that most IVF centers closed. Certainly all academic or hospital-based centers closed and not only closed, but moved a lot of the personnel into COVID-19 care situations. Some private centers like ours uh, remained open, but it was a small minority and there was a lot of conflict behind the scenes um, uh, between SRM and uh, some IVF centers about this first guidance. I don't want to get into the details. If you want to, to know more details about uh, what happened behind the scenes, please go to our monthly newsletter or on our website. Uh, we, from beginning of the COVID uh, 
situation, we have been publishing uh, regular updates uh, as so-called bulletins on our website, and you will find between our uh, newsletter and uh, those bulletins a lot of information about what was indeed going on behind the scenes uh, between uh, some of the major private providers uh, and ASRF. Um, numbers got much bigger very quickly and uh, as you can see here these are data from two or three days ago as of this point, uh, New York State has seen roughly 390,000 cases and 31,000 deaths. New York City alone has seen about 215,000 cases and almost 22,000 deaths. Fortunately, we are now uh, at a point where we have had days without death in New York City. And that is obviously uh, a, a wonderful uh, and important uh, step. Most IVF centers have also reopened uh, recently, not all yet, and not all yet uh, for all procedures. Uh, again, ASRM, uh, like also ASHRAE, have repeatedly uh, published uh, updated uh, guidances. Um, this virus has, of course, been highly, highly unpredictable, and therefore our knowledge base has dramatically changed over those uh, three months, uh, four months, um, and uh, the guidance from all professional organization has changed in parallel. The question that I think, uh, or one of the questions that we will have to address, obviously, is how many of these IVF centers that are reopening will remain open? Um, because one of the most important questions that I think nobody has an answer yet to is, uh, what is going to be the patient demand following all of these occurrences? In other words, are we going back uh, to the patient volume that we experienced before all of this craziness started, or are we going back to a much lower baseline? And if I have to predict, um, I, I must say I am very doubtful that we will go fully back to the uh, activity levels that uh, the IVF field was at before all of this started. Uh, we have studied in, in past uh, situations of economic decline what happens to IVF cycles in the US, and uh, we, we found that there was a very strong statistical correlation. Uh, simply said, um, in, in economically bad times, people don't want to have kids, and so both birth rates and IVF cycles drop pretty dramatically, and it takes usually quite some time uh, for everything to return. Um, so I mentioned that we decided not to shut down, and uh, that was not an easy decision. Um, but the rationale was based on a number of things. Uh, one of those, and maybe the most important one, was our census patient population. Uh, we are a very different IVF centers from most, if not all, uh, centers in the U.S. in that uh, over 90% of patients who come to us uh, have failed prior IVF cycles elsewhere, often multiple cycles, often at multiple centers. And they also represent the by far oldest patient population of any of our 500 plus IVF centers here in the US that are reporting uh, to CDC and SART. Uh, the average age uh, for IVF patients in the US uh, up to uh, 2016 has been 36 hours over the last three years has been 43. 
So we have a very unfavorable patient population at our center who simply do not have the time to lose. And therefore, we felt uh, that it wasn't fair to deny them care for an unpredictable time. Three months, four months may not make much difference in younger patients, but in a 45 or 46 or even 48-year-old patient, it makes obviously one hell of a difference. So that was one motivation. Uh, secondly, and this is where we disagreed with the most of the interpretation of the ASRM guidance, of the first ASRM guidance, uh, with many of our colleagues, we did not see that guidance as saying that every IVF center should close down. Uh, our interpretation was different. Uh, our interpretation was that, that the ASRM actually uh, published a very smart guidance because one of the points was that there is something like urgent, urgent infertility practice. Uh, SRM did not define that term specifically, but uh, clearly allowed exceptions from their recommendation to close down for urgent cases. Uh, and I think smartly they uh, left the, the, the definition of what represents urgent to centers. Most centers, uh, basically by closing down, said there is no, we do not have any urgent cases because if if they had urgent cases they should really not have shut down they should at least have provided uh, care to those urgent cases our argument was that most of our patients are urgent and therefore this became for us a very important rationale in not closing down uh, indeed in some patients uh, every month may make a difference. And uh, we also f uh, addressed an issue uh, that was uh, probably the top issue in the behind the scene discussions. Uh, and that was the question, is infertility an essential medical service? Uh, many of our colleagues who were very unhappy with the initial ASRM guidance were making the argument that by recommending shutting down, ASRM basically said that infertility is not an essential service. And that contradicts the, the long-standing fight that, that our field has, uh, has been facing in trying to convince government that infertility is a disease. And if fertility is a disease, then uh, infertility treatment is an essential service. And if it is an essential service, according to all the federal and local guidances, infertility services should not have closed down. Now, on a side note, Governor Cuomo, who is the governor of New York State, at a later point actually made a public statement that infertility services are considered essential services. And so in the retrospect, uh, New York's governor basically reaffirmed our thinking process uh, in not shutting down. And I think in many ways, uh, this is really what should have happened uh, nationally. I personally was never in agreement with uh, so many IVF centers shutting down. I fully accepted the fact um, that uh, IVF centers that did not have poor prognosis patients, and there are many, page, many IVF centers that serve a very young population, mostly first or second IVF cycles, one can indeed make an argument that in a crisis, in a healthcare crisis like we have ex been experiencing, uh, those those centers should take a break. But um, I personally feel that the extent to which uh, this was happening in the U.S. seemed 
uh, exaggerate. This shows you uh, another aspect of why our patients uh, are different. As you can see, over half of our patients travel to us, meaning that over half of our patients are not local patients. And so patients who are not urgent patients will not make that effort. Okay. In addition, uh, when we decided to stay open, uh, we could not follow advice because SRM didn't give advice to people who stayed open. We had to figure it all out on our own. We had to start worrying, how does this potentially affect our patients? How does it affect patients who travel to us? Indeed, many simply couldn't come anymore. And we found ourselves in situations where we had uh, to tell patients to continue their treatment locally. We had situations where when that happened, they couldn't find any open local IVF centers and they had to just give up until uh, flights became available again. So there were unique issues arising every single day that we never before had to confront and we had nowhere to look to. We had to make decisions ourselves on how to handle them. How do we protect our staff? Uh, it, it, now, now there are guidances from CDC and from other places. In those days that we didn't have any guidance, but we were aware of the fact that even if one of our staff members got infected, it could shut down the whole center because uh, of the separation policies that, that were already in place. Uh, so uh, it was a very complex time in terms of completely revamping how our center worked. And it is still working till today. You see me here with a mask uh, under very, very strict isolation criteria and in a very different way from how we used to work. Okay. Uh, Finally, we had to explain to our patients uh, that there was a risk uh, in continuing the treatment. And uh, they had to make a choice whether they really wanted uh, to, to pursue such a risk. And finally, we had also to explain the same thing to our staff. Oops, I'm sorry. So, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the economy. We have, by, as of today, over 45 million people have uh, applied for unemployment. I uh, don't have to tell you how much money uh, has been lost, not only in the US, but everywhere. How many businesses we will lose forever. If you walk uh, through New York City or drive to New York City, you would not believe how many for rent signs have sprung up uh, in stores all over some of the best streets and in some of the not so good streets. Uh, and I think uh, one of the most disturbing experiences to me uh, was how these, the, the so-called unintended consequences from all of this, from shutting down the economy, how all of these unintended consequences were completely overlooked in the public discussion of how to handle the COVID crisis. Our leading public health experts, who you could see on television every single day, often together with the president, giving daily press briefings, not once in the first few months mentioned unintended economic consequences. And when I'm talking about unintended economic consequences, I'm not only talking about the trillions of dollars that lost the businesses that will never open up again. I'm also talking about unintended medical consequences. They have been horrible. And we don't even understand as of this point how bad they are. 
because we do not know how many cancers haven't been diagnosed in timely fashion, how many of the so-called death due to COVID were really not death due to COVID, but because the cardiac disease uh, went out of control or the diabetes went out of control in those patients because they didn't get their usual medical care. And worst of all, in all of this, healthcare providers are being laid off to the left and to the right because these hospitals that were just a few weeks ago overrun by COVID patients are now empty. And they cannot afford to pay the salary. So uh, again, the management was not a very good one. And that brings me to the last point. I told you that we are located on the corner of Madison Avenue and 69th Street. What I'm showing you here is a picture that I took on June 1 uh, from one of the upper floors and it shows the intersection. And if you look closely, you will see there are some police cars uh, and you will see a few figures sitting on, on the ground. And what you're witnessing here is the arrest of a few people who were rioting on that night. It was the worst uh, or the second worst night of rioting. We were on 69th Street up to 63rd Street. Almost every single store on Madison Avenue, one of the prime shopping streets in Manhattan, was burglarized. Uh, windows were broken, uh, stores were looted, uh, all the big brand names are on the street, they all were smashed and looted. This was a very well organized effort. This was not only an accident, there were obviously other people, you know, who, who joined the crowd, no question about it. But this was an organized effort. I can tell you that from my own observation. About an hour before these arrests that I show you here in the picture took place, I looked out the window and I saw a so-called scout at work. This was one gentleman uh, who was taking pictures of those stores on the corner. And you, after he took the pictures, you could see that he was sending them somewhere and then he made phone calls. And less than an hour later, the first uh, demonstrators started coming up Madison Avenue. And as you can see here, we are fortunately arrested before they could smash the windows. There was no smashing over 63rd Street. If I showed you the same picture the next day, every single store along Madison was boarded up with wood planks. And many of those still are boarded up with wood planks. And Madison Avenue and Fifth Avenue and other areas of New York City, even though they are uh, starting to reopen, uh, look like after civil, like Beirut in, in, in the midst of the civil war. It was really a frightening experience. And I can tell you that that night when I shot this picture, I was seriously worried about our safety at the center and was thinking such crazy thoughts about what am I going to do if they break in and go into our, uh, freezing laboratory and, and, and start rans and, uh, ransacking our tank. Imagine that you have to think that. But that's exactly what I had to think at that moment. So uh, we obviously live in times of considerable social tensions. There is a lot of political opportunism going on. Everything is now geared at the November elections. Nobody really seems to care very much about anything else. The economic conditions are improving, at least that's what we are being told. Uh, but the social isolation is extreme 
and causing significant damage in terms of mental disease, suicide rates, child abuse, women abuse. It's a horrific thing, unprecedented. It is not healthy to have a lot of free time. So where will all of this take us? It's difficult to predict on a societal level, but we are clearly living in unprecedented times. And uh, there will be change. How far that change will go is, in my opinion, difficult to predict at the present time here in the United States. Um, the economy, as I said, is improving and there's some optimism. If you believe Wall Street, the optimism is actually quite remarkable because the stock market has almost completely recovered, uh, which frankly, I do not understand, but hey, uh, I'm always, uh, happy to be surprised in the positive. I would, however, be cautious. Uh, I think that our environment will radically change. Um, this will be a historical moment uh, on many societal levels, and it will obviously also involve the IVF field. I am convinced uh, that there will be a significant shakeout. Uh, um, uh, we are witnessing already some of it uh, in the US. Uh, already some of the IVF centers have changed hands, have changed ownership. Uh, and I strongly feel that there is more to come. But we are optimistic, and this is my, my last slide. Uh, many of you may know um, that uh, the Foundation for Reproductive Medicine over the last few years has been organizing uh, an annual conference in November on translational reproductive biology and clinical reproductive endocrinology. This conference is still on, and as of this moment, we hope indeed that it will be the first non-virtual, the first real conference, uh, at least in the US. Uh, ASRM just recently announced that they canceled uh, the conference and converted it into a virtual conference. We so far are hopeful that by November 19 through 22, uh, we will be able to welcome visitors safely to New York City. Uh, and therefore, I uh, would like to encourage you to consider uh, coming and joining us. This conference has been remarkably, remarkably successful in, in recent years uh, because uh, it is different from most other conferences. Uh, its modules are think differently and paradigm changes you will hear here first. So we're addressing controversial issues without economic influences and biases. Uh, and as I said, uh, we hope um, to be able uh, to make it a real conference. Uh, there will be uh, limitations um, because uh, I think distancing will still be required. So the number of registrants will be limited, uh, but we are in a new venue uh, where we have much more options uh, for safe distancing than in the old uh, the venue where the meeting has taken place before. So uh, with this, uh, I want to show you our staff numbers on the left and our affiliates. And my usual closing slide, uh, in many ways, uh, is very symbolic uh, for this moment, because if there is an event uh, in past history and in my lifetime that to some degree can be compared to what we have been witnessing over the last few weeks and months, then it was obviously 9-11. Uh, I don't know uh, whether you know that, 
but the facility I am in right now had its official opening party on 9-10, the day, the evening before 9-11. And uh, it was obviously an, another horrendous time. We had a lot of guests here from all over the world. Nobody could fly in and fly out for almost 10 days. Uh, and we got over it. And when you today look at that area that was so badly afflicted, it is better and bigger and more exciting than any time else. And we very much hope that the same thing will happen to New York City after those last three, four very difficult months. Thanks very much for listening. And anybody who has any questions, uh, you know where you can reach me. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Norbert. It was really an extremely interesting lecture about the crisis, the health crisis, the economic crisis that we are experiencing uh, this month. And I have for you some questions as you experience uh, the coronavirus in New York, which obviously was not easy. How did you manage with your staff, transportation, coronavirus testing, um, wearing masks or gowns or anything else, you know, coming in the morning, how the patients behave. And another question while coming in, uh, pregnancy, becoming pregnant at this time, what did you explain your patients uh, when the SRM asked to stop a treatment and you decided to continue treatment? On the other hand, no authority actually asked women not to become pregnant. So why yeah. IVF was abandoned and everybody can get pregnant if they can spontaneously become pregnant. So how, how did you deal with all this situation? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, to start with your last question first, uh, that was an obvious mm -hmm. argument. Uh, why why should we discriminate against women uh, who had an infertility problem, you know? Um, but as, a, as I said, it required a lot of work. It was not an easy decision for us to, to stay open. Uh, we were those strongly influenced by our patients. We had a lot of patients here who who were stuck uh, in a way they couldn't fly back suddenly uh, and we had a lot of patients who called and and kind of begged us not not to close down because they were planning on starting a cycle or they had started already a cycle so there was a strong uh, pressure from our patient community now uh, what did we do I mean, we basically invent, reinvented how we provide services. We had one big advantage, and that was that we have been used for many years uh, to handle patient interaction via the internet, via Skype or, or any other platforms, uh, because, uh, two-thirds of our patients are not local. This is how we have been practicing for years. So uh, this was not something new. So what we did is we just expanded it. We now said to our local patient also, you cannot come in just for a consultation. All consultations have to be done on a platform. Uh, we, we also changed the access. Uh, we allowed only patients into the office. Uh, all of their significant others had to wait outside. Um, we minimized the numbers of visits, uh, but we maintained the essential visits uh, for monitoring, for blood draws, and obviously for retrievals and, and transfers. Uh, we, we went on uh, on shifts, meaning uh, our staff was uh, cut into two teams. Uh, and 
there was only uh, half of the clinical team in-house while the other one was off. And the purpose was that at least in the early days where really nobody knew how is this virus infecting other people, etc., we wanted to make sure that um, if one person gets infected, it wouldn't mean that because of the required quarantine, we would have to shut down the whole center. Uh, it would give us the opportunity to just work with the other team. Uh, and and uh, so, so the, there were many, many major changes in, in how we, we practice. And we obviously also uh, changed the information. Uh, one, if you go to our website again and look at our newsletter and look at the bulletins uh, for our patient population, we maintain a very active information flow at all times. You will see there when the first uh, Pregnancies were reported, um, pregnancy outcomes. When the first reports came out that some, some uh, complications may occur, we immediately put that on to our bulletin. It was obviously very, very important to us to give our patients the best possible advice, uh, but fully recognizing that the advice we were giving was always incomplete and changed. Um, when you look at uh, what we were told, what we were told through the literature or through um, CDC or FDA uh, announcements, it's crazy how that changed. In the beginning, we were told that masks not only don't help, but may actually increase your risks. Now, we were smart enough never to believe this. Okay, so we 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 had a mask mandate from very very early on for every staff. But imagine that they are where our leading leading public health officials went on television, and we're not embarrassed to say that. It is it is really incomprehensible. Uh, but that's that's how the situation was. And I want to, uh, I, I, I think I want to make one, an, uh, another important point. When I'm sounding critical of uh, government, of hospitals, of SRM uh, guidances, I'm not really trying to, to, to be critical in the, in, because, we have never witnessed anything like this virus. Uh, so it is very easy to be critical uh, as a Monday morning quarterback. Uh, but uh, some of the stuff that was disseminated by so-called experts was really ridiculous. And the mask is just one example. And that reminds me of the behavioral science literature, uh, which, is over, which is really full with data that warns about expert opinions. And I would like to remind all the colleagues who are listening also, that amongst all the levels of evidence in our hierarchical structure of evidence-based medicine, there is a reason why expert opinion is at the very, very bottom. And our behavioral science colleagues have researched this in very, very much detail and they have very clearly demonstrated that experts are biased. And that's why expert opinions have so little value. 
because you become an expert by producing and living within your field of expertise and everything besides it uh, doesn't enter your expert opinion. It is just your environment in which you grow up in your expert field. And this is why a, a, a very credible person with an incredible achievement uh, history, like uh, Fauci, who is the head of the infectious disease branch at, at NIH, uh, could have come up with such ridiculous statements uh, early on as, uh, oh, this virus will never cause any harm in the U.S., and then uh, two months later, let's close down the country. But then you never heard him talk about unintended consequences, what it would do health-wise. I'm not even talking about the economy, health-wise. To 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 all the population if you cost down the economy because that guy had the shutters on he's an infectious disease guy he knows how to deal with infectious diseases but he doesn't know what it does to a cardiac patient or to the immunization of newborns or and so forth so I think if this, this epidemic has taught us one thing, then it is to be very careful in believing so-called experts. Our behavioral colleagues have known this for a long time. We need to let that know our politicians because our politicians who feel unable to make those decisions uh, then follow science so this has become the the new slogan in politics so we are all following science and you are not following science but i am following science uh, but following science really for these politicians means that they have their their advisor who believe and they do everything that that one advisor is telling them and that is obviously dangerous because it can lead to a lot of wrong decisions and we have witnessed this no but i don't know what the future brings to us but i think that we will walk with masks for a long time i think that the coronavirus will stay with us quite a long time at least until we have a vaccination that can be sent, you know, to everybody, which will take a lot of time. So I think there is no other possibility that the way of communication between people will be changed. We use, we will use a lot the internet, the way we are talking now. And I think also that IVF will be more and more automatic using less and less people that we will develop very quickly monitoring way from home patients will be treated from home will be monitored for home and will come to the clinic the minimum time actually they would need it so we'll do i don't know if we'll be able to do ultrasound from home but measuring hormones and giving initial treatment doing consultation i think a lot of things will be moved to be uh, on the internet as we are discussing it now I totally agree with you, Zev. I think the changes uh, in our field are still unpredictable, but they will be very, very significant. But I, I think the changes to society will also be highly, highly significant. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those moments in history that not only we will remember, but our children will will remember too, because it will change so many, many different things, or at least how we do them. Yeah. Okay, so we have to close the session. It was in, in very, very interesting. I thank you very much for sharing with us what you experienced in New York City obviously different in different parts of the world and yeah. we'll talk again soon thank you again robert
Pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you.